Lower Gaval and Aheron, the book of the takings of Ireland, tells of an early group of people who are said to have migrated here, called the Partholonians. Having settled here, one day, their leader, Partholon, decided to go out and survey the countryside, leaving his wife, Delgnet, at home. While he was away, his wife slept with one of their kin servants called Topa. To add insult to this injury, Delgnat and Topa drank from Partholon's cup using a special golden straw. Upon his return, tired and thirsty, Partholon sits at his table and calls for his cup. As soon as the straw touches his lips, he learns of the betrayal that had taken place. In a fit of blind rage, he stands up and kills the servant, Topa, and then he kills Delgnat's own dog, called Summer. Partholon had taken the law into his own hands, and for this reason, they went to law and sought the advice of a Breton. In her own defence, Delgnat said, Leaving her alone like that was like leaving honey before a woman, milk before a cat, edged tools before a craftsman or meet before a child. How could he expect her not to take advantage? But it is the judgment that was given that I want to talk about now. It is the earliest mythological judgment in Ireland. And it said, without deceit, with very noble judgment, it is the right of his wife to recover against Partholon. As restitution for this crime, Delgnat decided to name the very island where they had lived after her dog that had been slain by Partholon, and to this day it is still known as Inish Shemer. Now though this appears in the mythological accounts, these sorts of stories were what Brehens and the equivalent of lawyers would have used in their arguments, in their cases. These were like the precedents that were set in earlier times. Women have the right to recover against their husband. Now this might not sound like a lot today, but for the age and era that we're talking about, this is phenomenal. This is beyond anything else that we can see from contemporary legal systems. And while the early Irish system was a lot more progressive and had a much better attitude to women than any comparative system, at the time, it would be a disservice to history to say that women had equal rights to men in early Ireland. There were distinct differences between the rights and the life and duties of a man and that of a woman. But to give you an idea of the status of women, just consider this line from the Crick Avloch, a manuscript on Breton law. To his wife belongs the right to be consulted on every subject. So we can see straight away that at least in marriage, It was very much a partnership. The wife was not the property of the husband. She had a right to be consulted on every subject that affected the household. So I'm saying that, yes, women had more rights by comparison, but that might not be saying as much as we think when we first hear it. A woman's status was dependent upon the closest males, whether that be her husband, her sons, her father. This was the case unless she raised her status herself. Women could be educated. They could become druids. They could become poets. They could become teachers. They could become judges. There was no obstacles put in the way of women to achieve these things. Now, I imagine there wasn't much extra assistance given either, but there was no obstacles. And if a woman attained a high status through the merits of her labour, of her skill, of her her ability to assist her community in a way that other people couldn't, then she would raise her own status up and she would stand on her own standing, not that of her husband. So in a sense, having her honour prize based on the status of the closest male was really a way to bolster her standing, that she kind of was dependent or reliant upon them and that they were supporting her standing in the community with their own. And we can see the differences sort of serve as a social support mechanism, but there's a element of equality that runs throughout this, very much dependent upon the circumstances of every case. 
Now, while the wife had the right to be consulted on every subject, and she could veto contracts made by the husband when she wasn't consulted on them, her own contracts were invalid unless they had the consent of her husband, her sons, or her kin, her grandfather, and the people upon whom her honour price is resting. She couldn't go into contract without their consent because if she happened to breach the contract, their honour price would be affected. In addition to this, women could only give a sworn testimony in limited circumstances. Professor Fergus Kelly, writing in Early Irish Law, lists retinence, virtue and industry, and a steady tongue, a steady virtue, a steady housewifery, as good womanly qualities that he translated from the old triads, these groups of maxims that are always given in threes. So as you can see, the attitudes towards women in early Ireland is not black and white. And we can see that in many ways, the attitude to women was much better and much higher than contemporary systems and maybe even some systems today. But there are other places still that people might feel would be inappropriate or less equal if they were applied today. What I'm asking you to do is appreciate the context and the times of when all of this was happening. And the best way to do this is to appreciate what the rights of women were like in other countries at that time. And really, there is no comparison. So in this sense, women had much greater rights and a much better standing in early Ireland. There was a distinction between the status of men and women in normal household and social life. The status of the wife was generally dependent upon that of her husband's. But women were not excluded from working and they could be found of high rank within all the professions. There were women druids, women doctors, women Bretons, women poets and in earlier times there were even women warriors fighting alongside their men. Basically, except in relation to the chieftainship, women were not discriminated against or distinguished by their gender. Like the men, they were distinguished by their merit. A woman who undertook a course of study, whether in the arts, academics or trades, had her status based on her level of studies, the grade she had reached within her profession. If she happened to be a wife, her honour was judged to be her own when she reached a grade higher than that of her husband's. Once her professional grade entitled her to a higher honour price than she would through her marriage, she acted upon her own honour price in society, not her husband's. Now, please bear in mind that we're taking a general view of a fairly wide time frame here, and just like now, social attitudes changed with the times. A shift in the status of women is particularly noticeable between the pre-Christian and Christian eras. Although the manuscripts we have were written during the Christian period, those that speak of an earlier time, the legends and the sagas, always showed women to be strong leaders and powerful goddesses. As time went on and on, the status of women changed along the lines of the Judeo-Christian doctrines. Marriage was very serious business in early Ireland. We know a lot about it from a legal manuscript called Cain Lanovna which outlines the laws surrounding sexual unions. It appears from the laws that such customs came about as a means for ensuring children were looked after. In Ireland, there was no illegitimacy wherever paternity was certain, and it is for this reason that a woman's testimony during childbirth as to the paternity of the child was given a very high regard by the laws. But the attitudes to marriage were very different from our modern conceptions of monogamy till death us do part. Firstly, it was rarely done out of love, but rather for some mutual benefit between the two families. Marriage was a contract between the two families, involving a transfer of property into an arrangement of joint ownership. Marriage was a contractual arrangement involving the pooling of resources and wealth for the purposes of producing biological heirs, and the terms of this arrangement could vary greatly from one situation to the next. And how were these contracts formed? Well, 
When we have an agreement between two parties that is spoken or written and signed before verifiable witnesses, a contract takes place. So it was the mere speaking of the agreement that gave rise to the duties that it contained. So marriages could be formed quite easily. All that was required to do was to speak your intentions and the terms of the agreement before witnesses. But similarly, divorce could easily be formed also. Women had the right to choose their husbands and they should not be forced to marry anybody that they did not want to marry. Dowries were very important in early Ireland. A portion of this was known as the bride price and the interest in this property was retained by the wife throughout the marriage. If the husband struck his wife or gave grounds for divorce, she took her bride price with her. Trial marriages were also common, otherwise known as hand fasting. This occurred when a couple entered the terms of marriage for a previously agreed upon set of time, it was usually a year and a day. At the end of this period, the two people could walk away from the arrangement without consequences, or they could decide to make the arrangement more solid and lasting. There are various forms or types of marriage which we will look at now in a moment, but it's important to point out that men and women could each have multiple wives and husbands. They didn't practice monogamy in Ireland, they practiced polygamy. But there would generally be a chief wife or husband and the others would be secondary, taking on the role more of a concubine than what we might think of when we hear the word wife. The chief wife had more rights than the concubines and the law said they could attack a new wife for three days after the new marriage. While the chief wife had a direct right to some of her husband's estate, the rights of the concubine were decided according to the type of contract agreed upon at the time of marriage. All children of legitimate marriages were legitimate heirs. And as I said, this was because the purpose of marriage was to produce heirs. While divorce was a serious matter not to be entered into lightly, the very existence of divorce in early Ireland and the social attitudes towards both men and women's rights in marriage, as reflected in the Breton laws, reveals a progressive and significantly pragmatic society. Because divorce was such serious business, the Breton laws allowed for temporary separations or cooling off periods. But attitudes to divorce dramatically shifted with the coming of Christianity. The edicts of the Vatican became the norm and divorce would eventually become illegal in Ireland. And this would remain the case until as recent as 1995 when the Irish electorate voted to insert the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of Ireland, making divorce legal. In early times, as it does now, Divorce meant the final termination of the terms agreed to in the marriage contract. And, just like the marriage, there were important economic implications involved for all interested parties. There is the serious matter of the substantial financial and household investments of each of the wider family units to be addressed. Although grounds for divorce should be established, Blame was not attributed and penalties were not imposed by the law, which was much more concerned with the correct division of the household wealth. They were concerned with who gets the cattle, who got the goods, who got the wooden hut by the bog, and where the children going to be looked after. So basically, not a million miles away from today. The marriage contract was dissolved based on the terms of the original contract, and this took account of the status of the marriage, or the degree of coupling, as discussed in the legal manuscript, Coin Lanovna, but also the shares contributed in additional wealth by each of the parties, and, importantly, the contribution in household work known as argnom. If the husband gave grounds for divorce by striking his wife and leaving a mark, she recovered her original bride price, and kept this apart from the divisions of the final household wealth. Husbands could divorce their wives on grounds of unfaithfulness, persistent thieving, inducing abortion, 
shaming his honour, smothering her child, being without milk or through sickness. Wives could divorce their husbands on grounds of infertility, obesity, homosexuality, impotency and slander. Here's a quick reference to divorce from the life of Grace O'Malley, who had many husbands herself. The pirate queen Grace O'Malley married the lord of Rockfleet Castle, Richard Burke, only to divorce him after a year and a day. Summoning him to Rockfleet Castle and supported by her own followers inside, Grace shouted to Richard Burke, I dismiss you and claim the castle as her own. When we realise that Ireland is named after her mythological goddesses, names like Eru, Banva and Scotia, and the continuous archetypal theme of submission to the female throughout all of the mythologies, we realise that to get an understanding of the role of women in Irish society, we need to take a look at a much broader image than just legal status. Queen Macha is mentioned by Geoffrey Keating in his Forest Fiasa na Heron as an example and the only example I have ever found of a female Ard Ri, a female High King. Alamaka also features in the great epic The Tom Bo Cooley, The Cattle Raid of Cooley, which depicts the adventures of Cú Cullen. Here, Macha, a heavily pregnant goddess, is challenged to race the horse of a king. She reluctantly does this and wins the race, but the strain of it induces labour, and she gives birth to twins on the spot. This is said to be the origin of the name of a great palace which we now know as Navan Fort but was once known as Elwan Macha which once sat proudly in the county of Armagh otherwise known in Irish as Ard Macha or Macha's Height. Queen Maeve also features in the Tan Bo Cooley as the main female antagonist. This great Queen of Connacht rallies the men of Ireland and commands them forth marching to Ulster in order to try and seize the great Bull of Cooley. Her forces are held at bay by the single combat of Cúchulain. We also have an interesting, strong female personage in the character of Bridget. In pagan times, Bridget was a powerful triple goddess figure, made up of three sisters of the same name. She was celebrated during the pagan festival of Imbolg, which fell at the beginning of February. Her characteristics were manifold, but she is particularly connected to poetry, healing of the sick, and smithcraft. Later, a woman named Bridget would be converted to the new Christian faith and she would go on to leave a lasting mark on the island as a woman of great power and faith. Her temple at Kildare, meaning Church of the Oak, was famous for its perpetual flame that was kept burning by a set of elite nuns selected for the task. Geraldus Cabrensis, a famous Welsh historian, wrote that the flame burned behind a hedgerow beyond which no men were permitted to pass. The festival of Imbolg that was once dedicated to the goddess Bridget would later be dedicated to this Christian Saint Bridget, and even now, on the 1st of February every year, Saint Bridget's Day is celebrated in Ireland. These two figures, one a goddess, the other a much-loved saint with folklore and legends of her own, were gradually merged into the same Bridget figure during the Middle Ages, and it is clear that many of the pagan deities' attributes were then ascribed to the saint. So, in Bridget at least, we have a powerful female hero that bridges a gap between myth and history, and though she remains a mystery to us, her prestige and power cannot be denied. We have Grania Whale, Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen. As a woman, she had as much wealth and as much power as any other chieftain along the western coast. But she could not be recognised officially as chieftain under Irish law. Now, whether this came from prejudice or whether this came from the fact that the rights of kingship, the rights of being elected to chieftain, were symbolic and this symbolism required the chieftain to be a man. In any case, Grace O'Malley was a master mariner, a great tactician, 
And for all intents and purposes, she was the chieftain. She was the leader of her family. She is said to have famously sailed to England and demanded an audience of Queen Elizabeth I in 1593. We also continue this tradition of strong females into more recent times, the 1916 Easter Rising and the War of Independence were crucially supported by the women of Ireland. And it's a chapter of Irish history that would not be complete without having a significant mention of Come on the Man, the women's organisation. So there are accounts of heroic women throughout all of Irish history and mythology. The number of them is probably a lot fewer than we would like to see. Whatever the case, when we take a whole picture of woman in early Irish society, taking account of the legal status, their role in mythology and throughout history, we see a very complex and dynamic and important figure. So important that the story of Ireland is not complete without giving a due and proper mention to the Manana Heron, the women of Ireland.